Good day, everyone, and welcome to the Celebrating Reunification Month, Preserving Families and Creating Connections virtual event. I will now turn it over to Taffy Compain with the Children's Bureau to begin. All right. Thank you, Chris, and welcome to our event, Celebrating National Reunification Month. Um, our event today is Preserving Families and Maintaining Connections. As Chris mentioned, my name is Taffy Compain, and I'm the National Foster Care Specialist at the Children's Bureau. And I have the honor of giving a, a few opening remarks before our main event today. Um, I'm actually super, super excited about the folks that we have presenting, um, the program that they run, um, and just their, their passion and, and some of the real work that they've been able to do to increase successful reunification. So I'm not going to take a long time. Um, but National Reunification Month is, is an event that started about a decade ago by the American Bar Association Center for Children and the Law. And the purpose is to bring awareness, education, and recognition um, to that primary building block of foster care, which is reunifying families. Um, for the most recent AFCARS data, we've, we have just under 424,000 children in foster care, and 32% of them live in relative homes, 46% in non-related foster homes, so pretty close to 80%, uh, about 80% are actually in foster homes. And um, uh, the reunification is, is the most widely applied case plan goal at about 55% of the children and youth in care having a goal of reunification. Uh, we at the Children's Bureau support agencies continuing to find ways to promote reunification, including working with the courts, with parents, attorneys, and engaging in uh, the community service agencies to more comprehensively provide parent support and services, but also to really engage with them in genuine relationships, giving mothers and fathers an authentic voice in receiving our services and interventions and uh, in reuniting their families. Uh, we currently run several discretionary grants um, that include family engagement interventions, support to parent partners or champion programs, and also that have to do with shared parenting between resource and birth families. As we really aim to increase tested and proven strategies and interventions, the, the field uh, knowledge base uh, for uplifting the families of origin. So I'd like to sincerely thank all of you for making this an important part of your day. Um, and I'd especially like to thank any mothers and fathers that uh, are able to be with us um, that were involved with the system that uh, were able to successfully reunify their families. And also to thank, many, I see many, many, many of you um, on the line. I appreciate that. I really want to thank all of you as professionals that really believe in the importance of family and of keeping family together and of supporting mothers and fathers and being able to reunify um, with their children for lasting and permanent uh, reunification. So I really just want to say thank you to all of you for being with us. I'm going to briefly go over the bios for our incredible presenters that we have today. Um, and, I, and I really do mean that. This is just a really great group of folks. Um, we've got much longer bios available in the, um, in the uh, products for the event. Um, but first, we're going to hear from Katie, Katie Byron. She started her journey in the world of adoption and foster parenting when she and her husband adopted their first daughter 12 years ago, and then fostering their son, whom they eventually also adopted. Katie's passion is helping caregivers and parents build child-centered relationships with each other. Katie also created Fostering Connections for Families and the Fostering Connections Program, which focuses on developing a network of support for families involved in child welfare systems by establishing relationships focused on that child's well-being. The program helps caregivers and parents build a working relationship to maintain essential connections for the child that is placed in out-of-home care, which of course also helps to reduce trauma for that child. 
Um, the goal of the program is to reduce trauma experienced by these children by supporting and facilitating a positive relationship between the child's parents and the current and temporary caregivers. We'll also be hearing from Jacob Denunzio. Uh, he is a managing attorney of the Parent Representation Program at the Washington, Washington State Office of Public Defense. And prior to joining the team at OPD, Mr. Denunzio's work at the Court Improvement Training Academy provided training and support to attorneys and judges working in dependency and in termination cases. He also serves on the Washington, Washington State Citizens Review Panel, the Innovative Dependency Court Collaborative, and various other committees that he's uh, working in towards improving the state's child welfare system. And really want to appreciate having you here with us because the involvement of the court and parents' attorneys is so critical. They're such a necessary partner to really improving our outcomes and reunification. So appreciate having you here. Uh, Sharonda Silunov is the Director of the Public Policy at Children's Home Society of Washington, and she brings a fierce and passionate voice advocating for systemic change for parents and their children involved with child welfare. She was previously involved with the system herself due to a severe drug and alcohol addiction. Now fast forward to today, and Sharonda continues to learn more about the child welfare system from a kinship caregiver's perspective as she's caring for her grandson. And please join me in congratulating her as the recipient of the 2021 Casey Excellence for Child Award. We also have Sean Powell with us, um, the program coordinator for Parents for Parents program in King County. This program helps uh, to provide support for families involved with CPS and open dependency cases. Working for this program allows her the opportunity to give back to the community where she received so much support during her own experiences with CPS and the dependency system. She has a degree in social and human services from Lake Washington Institute of Technology in Kirkland, and she's also a certified peer counselor. We also have Amy Jacobson, a foster and adoptive parent in Washington State. Amy believes strongly in the power of relationships as a critical component of a collaborative child welfare system. Amy co-chairs the Building Family Partnerships Committee and facilitates Amara's STAR Adoptive Parent Support uh, Group. And we also have Diana, uh, Deanna Morrison, an Engagement and Program Manager with the Washington Department of Children, Youth, and Families. So we've got a big program, a lot of folks, they all bring such incredible knowledge and lived experience for some, a true commitment and passion. So with that, um, I want to turn it over to Katie to begin our program. Slide shows four topics. Number one, why do relationships matter? Number two, what does it look like now? Number three, what is our vision for the future? Number four, how do we get there? Thank you so much, Kathy. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. So let's start off with just a brief agenda overview. Today we're going to hear from the amazing group of people that Taffy just introduced. And we're gonna learn why they are working so hard to promote the building and supporting of relationships to support reunification in both Washington State and on a national level. We're going to start from hearing why do these relationships matter? And then we're gonna hear from our panelists as they share their lived experience about what this currently looks like in child welfare right now and what their visions are for the future. And finally, we'll conclude with a deep dive into tools and resources that you can use to support and promote this culture shift in your area. And I just also wanted to say that this incredible group of people is really demonstrating the collaborative effort and the teamwork that it really takes to build these successful relationships. And so, instead of working in silos, by partnering together, as we are doing on this presentation, we can really support families and children in reunification. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Jacob, and he's gonna to explain to us why supportive relationships are not just nice to have in child welfare, but are actually critical for children and their families. Jacob? The slide being displayed is titled, Let's Talk About Language, Column One, Language Used in Child Welfare evolving, many different terms in use, differing perspectives. Column two, graphic displays the message, words have power. Image titled removal. Hi, thank you. Are you able to see my, my webcam? 
Did I get that on right? We are, Jacob. Oh, fantastic. Okay, um, so can you uh, move to the next slide? Great. So, um, so those of us who are involved in child welfare, we have gotten the message over you know the last six, maybe ten years, um, that removal from a parent is traumatic. It's a traumatic experience, and experts now say that it causes an ACE or an adverse childhood experience. Um, and it, there may be some question about whether or not that is the case for all kids. I think there's uh, been conversation around about um, you know maybe the the behaviors or the issues that kids have when they come into care or they show when they come into care is about the, uh, the adverse childhood experiences or the trauma they're experiencing in home with their, with their parents. Now, my youngest son is, uh, he's now six, but he's been one of my very biggest teachers and I'm going to share a story with you in the hopes that you can see what I saw through his experience. Uh, he was almost three years old and um, he had been in daycare for a couple of years and we were getting ready to move to preschool and we found the best preschool in town and dropped him off on his very first day at about nine o'clock. And then my wife and I went to uh, the kindergarten just around the corner uh, in order to meet with my middle son's kindergarten teacher. And um, he had been there for about two hours when he left. He told the preschool teacher he needed some alone time and then walked out the front door, hopped over the fence and started his way downtown where he knew my office was. Um, at about that time, a police officer just happened to be driving by and saw my almost three-year-old son on one of the busiest streets in Olympia, uh, naked from the waist down, and thought to herself, well, that doesn't look right, and pulled over and got out of the car. And like the good child of a public defender, my son ran. Uh, so the cop chased him. And although he will tell you that she placed him under arrest, he was not under arrest. Uh, she was trying to protect him. She, uh, you know, called in to the 911, and no one had been looking for him at that point, so she didn't know that he belonged anywhere or where he, who, who he belonged to. Um, my last name and his last name is Denunzio, and at almost three, it was very difficult for him to say his last name. Um, the preschool teacher finally realized that he was missing and finally called 911. Now, my child was on his way to being uh, taken to Child Protective Services, but fortunately, um, the officer didn't have a car seat to place him in. So while the car seat was being transported to her car, she got word of where he was supposed to be. Uh, so two hours, about two and a half hours, he was uh, not in a... Uh, a known adult or a safe adult's care. Um, I got to him about three hours after that. Um, and for that three hour period of time, he experienced a tremendous amount of stress and fear. And um, he was not experiencing any type of abuse or neglect in our home. Um, but for about a year and a half after that, he had night terrors, had increased separation anxiety, had a very difficult time um, being dropped off anywhere. Um, and would frequently talk about when he was lost. Um, and, and again, that was, that was all a very short, a short moment in time that caused him a, a tremendous amount of, uh, of stress. He's, he's better now, um, and the preschool got shut down for 45 days while they built a higher fence and put more bells and whistles on their doors. Um, and for those of you who are interested, we did not go back to that child care or that daycare. Uh, we found a different one. Um, but that, for me, really cleared up whether or not even a short-term removal uh, was, was potentially damaging. Now, some kids who come into the system, they, they fare better um, than others. Some of them are more resilient. Some of them are more sensitive. And we're going to talk about some of the ways in which, uh, as a system, that we can help provide more resilience. We can help provide more opportunities um, for healing. Uh, can you go to the next slide, please? slide displayed is titled ACEs, which stands for Adverse Childhood Experiences. Um, so again, kids coming into care, just the, the act of removal and placement into care creates an adverse childhood experience. On average, um, what we know from research is that kids coming into care have between three to four ACEs. Um, again, that's on average. Um, some have fewer, some have more. Um, and on average, what those ACEs are for are 
um, things like a chaotic household or a chaotic family environment. So parents with a drug or alcohol problem, with a mental health issue, incarcerated parents, uh, poverty, homelessness. So they're, they're experiencing these ACEs uh, and traumatic experiences, and then we place them into care and we provide them with an additional ACE. And then the ACEs don't stop accruing once kids are in care. Um, on average, kids exiting care exit with between six to eight ACEs. And what the research is now showing is that um, the ACEs for a neglectful or a, a chaotic household decrease when you're in care, um, but the ACEs experienced for things like physical abuse, emotional abuse, and sexual abuse, um, some experts say that doesn't dr drop, doesn't go down or decrease, and some say it actually increases in kids. Um, and, you know, what we know is with a higher rate of ACEs, you have, um, you know, poorer outcomes for kids. And those, uh, those outcomes, they don't start to level off as you become a grown-up. They actually, uh, they move you further and further away from your peers who uh, did not have uh, the high rates of, of ACEs. Uh, next slide, please. So there are um, there are several different types of, of stress, and, and again, placement into care is a stressor. Um, there are three types. One is uh, positive stress, things like um, a big sporting event or a test or something that you have to, uh, that, that you rise to the challenge of, it's over, you either won or you lost, but it creates some resilience in you because you met that challenge. Um, there's tolerable stress, so that is um, stress that's generally short in duration or stress that you have um, the ability to process. So uh, for kids, that, uh, that generally looks like having um, a parent or a trusted adult, a grown-up who can help you process the information. So you uh, have a car accident and it's a huge stress, but you have a person who is with you who can help you talk about car safety and how many other people experience car accidents and that they're safe and then so that and it's a short duration and it generally doesn't become a toxic stress. Um, and then the last type of stress is that toxic stress. So that's a, a challenging situation that has no end or where there's not an adult to help you process that information. And for many kids, and I would say most kids, um, being placed into care is is uh, becomes can become a toxic stress. So it's uh, it's a, a, generally speaking, a long period, um, and the adults in your life are not staying consistent, and so you don't have the ability to actually fully process the information. And again, we're going to talk more about how we can help that, help kids do that. Um, next slide, please. Um, so ambiguous loss. I, <clears throat> for those of you who haven't read the book, The Neglected Transition, I would highly recommend it. It's uh, written by Monique Mitchell who's um, an expert in grief and loss in foster care, and she talks about uh, ambiguous loss. Now, when ambiguous loss was first coined to, uh, to describe a physical presence with a psychological absence. So you have a loved one who has dementia or Alzheimer's, and they're physically there, but they're psychologically missing. So there's no, there's no end. They haven't died. You can't um, fully grieve the end of the relationship because they're still physically present. Um, for kids in care and for parents with kids in care, that ambiguous loss is the reverse. So there's a physical absence with a psychological presence. Kids know, mostly know their parents are alive, their parents are around, they don't know where they are, they don't know when they're going to see them again. And the same thing for parents. Parents know their kids are in someone's house, they're being cared for, but they don't know by whom, they don't know when they're going to come home, and it's, again, it's that, uh, it, become, it can become a very toxic stress because it's, it's uh, never ending, it's ongoing, it's, for kids and for parents, it's, a, it's an uncanny experience, there's no explanation for it, and for us in the system, we can't tell them when it's going to end. We can't say, you know, you're going to go home to your parents' on this day, because we don't have those answers. Um, uh, and again, it's, a, it's a, a relational disorder. It can be traumatic all on its own. And when you talk to um, kids who've been in the system, what they'll say is, you know, every time the phone rang, my first thought was, maybe it's my mom. 
Um, every time there's a knock on the door, the first thought is maybe it's my mom. The second thought is maybe it's the social worker coming to move me again. So you can, you can tell that kids in those situations very rarely have the ability to actually calm their insides. Um, go ahead and to the next slide, please. Chart is titled Patterns of Stress Activation. Column 1, Unpredictable, Extreme, Prolonged, Sensitization, Vulnerability. Column 2, Predictable, Moderate, Controllable, Tolerance, Resilience. Okay, so, um, so we, we're talking a little bit about resilience um, and you know, being sensitive or being vulnerable. So for, um, again, for that, the stress activation, so uh, for, uh, for stressors that create resilience, and we talked about a, a soccer match or a big game, right? So you know the game is going to be 90 minutes, you're going to play really hard, um, it's, it's controllable, you know the start time, you know the end time, you can practice up until the beginning of the, of the match, um, it, it creates tolerance, and then in, inevitably you come out with what some people call grit. Um, or resilience, right? You have the ability to rise to meet the challenge and then the ability to step away from the challenge and the stress ends. Um, for the stress activation, and this is a lot about sort of brain patterns, right? And, and whether or not um, your brain and your body are able to, uh, to calm down enough to do the developmental tasks that kids need to do even while they're in care. So, Again, the, the stress is unpredictable. So you as a child have no ability to determine when you go home. You have no ability to determine where, when or how you move to the next placement. Um, it's extreme. Like, so for, for kids who are placed into care, they lose not only their parents, they oftentimes lose their siblings, they lose pets, they lose their house, they lose their community, coaches, teachers, uh, you know, church members, all of the people, often even times, daycare providers whom they have a, a close relationship with. Um, but that, that pattern of stress activation creates uh, sensitivity. It creates vulnerability. Go ahead and go to the next slide, please. The slide is titled Impacts of Foster Care and lists depression, behavioral problems, anxiety, ADHD slash ADD, hearing slash vision issues, learning disabilities, developmental delays, asthma, obesity, speech problems. Okay, so, um, you know, lots of bad news so far. Just a really brief touch on um, how kids are doing in care. Uh, seven times more likely than kids similarly situated, and so these are not, we're not talking about kids in care versus uh, white upper middle class kids with two parents and a white picket fence and all that. Um, similarly situated kids. So seven times as likely to experience depression, six times as likely to experience behavioral problems, five times more likely to experience ADHD and ADD, hearing problems, learning disabilities, developmental delays, um, you know, sort of the list kind of goes on and on. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so we're going to kind of shift gears into how do we help how do we help kids? What are the things that we can do? And, and parents, too. This applies to everybody who's experiencing a, a traumatic situation. So um, what uh, Dr. Bruce Perry uh, has talked about is the, is the sequence of engagement. So you start with the lower stem of the brain and work your way up. For those of you who have kids, if they're you know, explosive and angry, it doesn't work really well to reason with them. Um, you can't say, you can't do these things because they're dangerous. The kid's like, no, I want to play Floor is Lava, and you can't tell me not to, and they're screaming at you. And until we can go up the brain stem, we're not going to be able to engage their, their uh, cognitive uh, abilities. So the first step is really helping them regulate. Now, what helps people regulate is, like we talked about, being with someone who, it, who they trust, who they feel safe with. It's that, it's that calming sense that, oh, I feel safe right here. For some folks, it's rhythm, music, walking, moving their bodies, doing something that helps to actually regulate the, the lizard brain or the amygdala. Um, and then from there, you can go into relate, right? So you regulate, you help calm that central nervous system, and then you go into relationship. 
Um, for those of you who have taken parenting courses, you know that without a good relationship, you're not going to be able to provide appropriate discipline or uh, redirection. So relating uh, looks like, again, being with a trusted adult, being comfortable with that trusted adult. And then you can go into the, the logic part of the conversation. So regulate, relate, and then reason. Go ahead to the next slide, please. The quotation, connectedness has the power to counterbalance adversity, Dr. Bruce Perry. Slides shows image of a set of scales. The left side of the scales is labeled adversity and the right side is labeled relational health. Under the scales is the label development risks and health problems. Um, okay, so what we know for kids is that they are experiencing adversity, right? So we have ACEs, we have removal, we have um, you know, placement into foster care, placement with people that you don't know, placement with uh, adults that you haven't developed trusting relationships with. Sometimes you develop trusting relationships with those folks and then you move again um, without the ability to control any of that. So you have this adversity. Now what do we do on the other side of that? How do we help kids balance out uh, what they're experiencing. Well, what we can do as, as the grown-ups in the system is provide relationships, provide trusting, consistent relationships, um, relationships with their parents that are developmentally appropriate relationships, that are successful relationships. So if you have an infant, you can't just have one visit per week and expect that that relationship is going to help uh, weigh out the adversity that the child is experiencing. It has to be developmentally appropriate. Family time has to be engaging for the kid. It has to be safe for the kid. It has to be safe for the parent. And by safe, I don't mean somebody sitting knee to knee with the parent and the child taking notes. What I mean is a, a, a way in which kids and parents can come back together again and experience the connection that they have, that bond and the attachment that they have. Um, you know, oftentimes what the visitation experts will say is an activity that creates relation, uh, swimming lessons being one of them, right? So for little kids, being in the water with, their, with a grown-up, with a parent, means close physical contact. It means a trusting relationship. That child has to rely on that parent in order to be in the swimming lesson. Um, so, and relational health not just with parents, but also with caregivers. Are we setting caregivers up appropriately? Do they have, do we have the right matches? Do we provide opportunities for, um, and we'll talk about this in a minute, but for parents and for caregivers to connect so that caregivers have the information that they need to be successful? What kinds of food does the kid like? How does the kid, you know, go to bed easier? How, you know, what are the things in which we can do and help provide to the caregivers so that they can be successful and create another trusting relationship with that child? Um, and all of that, helps to offset the developmental risks, the health problems that we talked about, um, and you know, it really sort of sets them up for greater resilience and, and the, a greater likelihood that they will come out of this intact. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so reunification matters, relationships matter, and if we want to create um, reunification that actually works, that is stable, that, um, that is successful, we need to continue with the relationships. We need to continue to build the relationships. Now, I know my counterparts are going to talk a lot about building relationships between parents and caregivers, but what the research shows is that if kids see the adults in their lives working together, being connected, being on the same page, communicating, having similar rules, having similar expectations, um, kids feel safer uh, in the the neglected transition, the, there's a series of different interviews with kids who say things like, you know, all I wanted was to know that my mom knew where I was and knew that I was safe or could tell me that I was safe. Parents can't do that if they don't know who their child is with or they don't have some relationship or connection to that child. Um, I had a case many years ago with, uh, with a dad who worked really, really hard to get his kids back and his kids had pretty extreme behavioral issues in the in the placement, they were, you know, smearing poop on the walls and urinating in the corners and having just really extreme behaviors. And they moved from home to home, and they finally landed in a caregiver's home who was super committed. And although resistance or 
I would say resistant, reticent, reached out to the parents. And what ended up happening was this really kind of a, a sweet story, but the kids, in order to show their parents loyalty, would do things like pull, uh, pull old shoes out of the garbage can and wear them to the visit and say, like, look, Dad, look what my foster parents are making me wear. And because the parent and the foster parents were connected and able and were talking, the dad could say, hey, actually, I know you got new shoes last week and you pulled those out of the garbage. I actually know that you're safe. Um, and I'm working really hard to get you back, uh, which it's just calmed everybody down. The kids went home and still have contact with their caregivers and, and are doing quite well at this point. Why relationships matter in supporting reunification, sense of belonging, maintaining connections, resiliency, decreased stress, better outcomes. So, yep, that's my last slide. So with that, I will, I will hand it back off. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jacob. That was that was fabulous. Um, so now we're going to kind of hear from people with some lived experience. So people who have either been parents in the system or caregivers. And we're going to hear why do they feel that these relationships are supportive and kind of what is their vision for the future. And I remember I came to this work um, after meeting a mom and this mom had had several children that were adopted through closed adoptions through the foster care system. And this was years later. And the hurt and the difficulty she had because she didn't know if her kids were safe. She didn't know where her kids ended up. She didn't know if they were safe. And it just really opened my eyes that we, we have to do something different. And then as a caregiver, my experience in the system was just watching everybody kind of work in their silos. The parents were over here, the caregivers were over here, everybody's got apartments over here. And I was just watching people progress through like the life of a case and everybody was coming out hurting. And no matter what the outcome was, the if the child reunified, the caregiver had no idea where the child had gone because they had never met the parent. If the child had a different form of permanency, like adoption, the parent didn't know where they were. And so all of that, just watching that, I was like, we have to do something different. This isn't this isn't okay. I can't watch this anymore. And so that's kind of what brought me to this work. And then I would see successful reunifications where the caregiver and the parent stayed in contact long after the department was no longer involved. And everybody just seemed to be faring a lot better. And so that's what brought me to this work. Um, Sharonda, why do you feel relationships are important? And kind of what do you see as your vision for the future, if you could make, wave a magic wand? Well, first of all, I just want to say, you know, I come to this discussion as a kinship caregiver. And the only reason why I'm in this discussion with all of you is, is because a foster parent who's also on this call, Amy Jacobson, uh, partnered with me in caring for my grandson. Had I not had the partnership with uh, Amy, I would not have kept my grandson, and my ability to preserve my family would have been lost because my grandson eventually, I am sure, would have been uh, adopted. So I just want to just kind of ground us in that because that is my story and why I come to this. Um, of course, you know, I can tell you that as a kinship caregiver that part of preserving families and maintaining relationships and creating those connections is having those pieces um, put together so that the stress and the um, barriers that can happen when you're caring for family, when you're caring for family and you are having a child, your own child, there's a lot of process going on. So I really know that part of me of creating the connections and the importance of it is really based on me being able to be the best that I can be in caring for my grandson. Had I not been able to to create these connections, particularly with Amy, while I, you know, would have, you know, done what I'm doing, I don't know if I'd be as happy as I am doing it. And I think that that's a really important piece for people to kind of grapple with and understand that a lot of times people do the responsible thing, but at some point they're suffering while they're doing it. So the creating of connections really um, supported me in showing up as my best self by having those relationships 
and that support in caring for my grandson. So those are the reasons why I think creating connections are so absolutely important, particularly coming from a kinship caregiver's lens. Thank you so much, Sean. I really appreciate it. Sean, how about you? Oh, Sean, it looks like your phone's on mute. I told myself I wasn't going to do that. Uh, so um, I come to this discussion too with my own personal experience, and um, I have, you know, been through the dependency process twice with my three children, and um, you know the relationship that I had before I was CPS involved uh, were all unhealthy and toxic, um, and and uh, I think that by allowing myself the opportunity to build connections with the people I was uh, introduced to throughout my dependency case, um, it really helped to build some structure around um, healthy boundaries and, and continuing those relationships. One of them was uh, with my parents, uh, and there was added layers of emotion and stress and uh, animosity with my parents, you know, being kinship caregivers, where that wasn't that extra layer when my kids were placed with uh, licensed foster care. Um, building relationships with them really taught me how to give myself space and interact more effectively and, and in a positive way with the kinship caregivers. Um, and so I think with the, uh, the families that I work with today, um, you know, they would tell you that they, they don't do it alone. They rely on relationships, and not just the caregiver relationships, but relationships with everyone that they're involved with. Um, and the idea, you know, that we are sharing uh, relationships with the children as well and making sure that there's a continuum of care with the children so that that same um, care from the parents is transferring to the caregivers, whether it's kinship or licensed care, and then ongoing. Um, and the kids see that. The kids see those relationships and how strong they can be. And then they're more able to replicate that. Um, and they feel safe. And that, that feeling and sense of safety that is provided to the children throughout that process also is provided to the parents who then um, are continued to be motivated to, to make progress and move on in that. Thank you so much, Sean. Amy, would you like to share? Yes, thanks, Katie. Um, so I feel that uh, parents and caregivers greatly benefit from building relationships, but I really feel the kids benefit. Um, through the relationships, I believe that it's the best scenario for kids to see their parents and caregivers working together. Um, it builds a sense of safety for the kids um, when there's a support network of adults. Um, it's also when we build relationships, we learn from each other and about each other, and it can remove misunderstandings and perceptions that we have each, of each other. Um, and Rhonda and I have this lived experience um, of seeing the benefit of, of King staying with her. Um, through our relationship, we've not only through Sharonda and my relationship, it's not only a benefit for Sharonda and King, but it also benefits my family. We've uh, grown a huge community of support where we're supporting each other, and um, Sharonda and I can support each other and our families, so we can provide um, King with stability. He's happy. He's with his family, um, and that's very it, it's important for him to see us all get along and support each other and um, grow our community. Um, and it's my vision that uh, we can all work and partner together to be supportive of reunification and kids staying with their family. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amy. And I think probably we all share the vision after listening to each of you that we don't want this to be the one-off or the, oh, you know, I once heard of a caregiver and a parent that had a good relationship. And, you know, it turned out pretty good, but that's just not the norm. We want this to become the norm. And that this collaboration and that everybody being able to work together and seeing the 
the benefit that each person brings to the relationship becomes central to supporting reunification and just everything in child welfare because as humans we need we need other people we need support it feels good when we have other people on our team and I just would like that to become the norm instead of the oh yeah I saw that one next slide please and so now that we've heard these relationships, the power of these relationships, and we've heard some visions of the future. It's time to talk about how we shift the culture of child welfare to a more collaborative model. So I'm going to turn it over to Deanna Morrison from DCYF to kind of talk about uh, the Department of Youth, Children, and Family Services here in Washington and kind of where they're at right now in supporting these relationships. Deanna? Hi, Katie. Thank you. Yes, this is Deanna Morrison. I'm the Engagement Program Manager, uh, currently working for Department of Children, Youth, and Families. Unfortunately, I'm unable to attend by video, so you get me here with audio. But just in brief, um, Washington State, um, including obviously DCYF, we've really embraced the theory of relationship building. Um, we've seen the stats, we've read the data, and it is strong, strong proof that children do do better when families do have um, <clears throat> relationships with the entities that are involved with them while they're working through service agreements. Um, and so we've embraced this, and we have um, we have two really big projects going on right now. One is the Family Connections with Katie Buren and, and working with Amara. And uh, we're working on an expansion project because the idea of having the parents identify the need to, to want to have a better relationship and wanting to be more involved with those that are caring for the children um, has been like a statewide um, all jump on the bandwagon, let's go. So that's been really a great, um, it's been really great watching this little seed grow. And uh, we're super excited about the future of this, this program. Um, the other program that we have in project mode is a partnership we have with Casey Foundation and um, this program is called Building Family Partnerships. Kind of has the same similar um, approach in the relation building aspect. However, we are doing uh, listening sessions to get lived experiences. And what we want to do is gather that information and take it to our leaderships um, involving our, our parent allies and all our external stakeholders and taking it to our leadership and say, Here's what we're hearing. These are lived experiences. This is what needs to change. So DCYF as a whole has fully embraced, uh, I guess you could say we've drank the Kool-Aid, we believe in it, and um, we're overly thrilled with uh, the feedback that we received this, thus far. And we really looked, uh, we're really looking forward to distinguish or, or um, getting rid of ambiguous loss as most as best we can and really bringing uh, the parents more into the team atmosphere rather than us telling them what it is they need to do. We want them to be a part of the solution. We want them to be a part of going forward and we want them to get their children back. So with that, I will pass it right back to Katie. Well, thank you so much, Deanna. Um, so next slide, please. Slide is titled Family Connections Program. Program elements are connections meetings, peer mentor support, focused on building and maintaining child and family-centered relationships. I wanted to take a minute also just to let you all know we're going to have a Q&A with all these uh, panelists at the end. So if you have any questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat and we will answer them at the end of the presentation. So the Family Connections program was kind of born out of that experience that I just talked about of seeing the harm that was being done with these adversarial relationships in child welfare. 
And so I kind of was going around and asking, like, how can we do this different? How can we build relationships? How can we have this not be the unicorn but be the standard? And I found an amazing group of stakeholders that just included all sorts of individuals. It was parents. It was caregivers. It was kinship caregivers. It was the department. Um, and everybody got together and said, yeah, you know, we see that kids do better and families do better when we build these relationships. But there's not a great structure in Washington State of how to do this. And so we built out the Family Connections Program. And at the heart of this program is a connections meeting. And the connections meeting is just a meeting where we're bringing together a parent and the caregiver of that child. And they're having a meeting that is facilitated by a parent ally. So that is a parent who has successfully navigated the child welfare system and is now mentoring other parents as well as a caregiver mentor. And the caregiver mentor can be a kinship caregiver. It can be a licensed foster caregiver. We have a lot of different options. But they are offering peer mentor support because what I thought about when I came into this system as a caregiver 14 years ago, I guess, um, I was scared. I was really scared. And I was thinking, what would it have taken to get Katie at the table to meet the parents? And I said, you know what it would really take is someone who had been through this, who understood kind of where I was coming from, who could say, yeah, you know, I, I hear your fear. And here's some information that I can give you to help you get over that fear. And so I was like, peer mentor support is what would get me there. Don't give me a document full of 10 things I can do. Like, give me someone on the phone that I can talk to who will say, here's how you do this. Here's, here's the triumphs and the successes as well as some challenges. And so this program uses the peer mentor support, brings the parent and caregiver together. And this meeting is facilitated and very structured. So there are a lot of things we don't talk about. We don't talk about case plan. We don't talk about court order visitation. What we do talk about is those things that Sharonda and Amy have talked about, and Jacob also. Like, how is the child put to sleep at night? What is their routine? Is there a sippy cup they're missing? Is there a special stuffy that didn't make it with the child? And we need to find that stuffy because that's a comfort object for the child. Where's the child in school? What is the child successful in? And what, where do we need to support the child? And so it's really a very, very focused meeting. It, the only people that attend are the caregiver, the parent, and the two mentors. And we're just keeping it small, positive, and supportive. And we're finding a lot of success in that. And so that is the program in a nutshell. And now I'm going to turn it over to Sean to tell you a little bit more about the Connections meeting. Slide is titled, What is a Connections Meeting and Who is There? The slide has no text. Okay, make sure I'm off mute now. Um, so from a parent mentor or a parent ally mentor perspective, um, a Connections Meeting is a voluntary opportunity for parents and caregivers to meet and talk about the needs of the child placed out of the home. In the preparation for and during the meeting, we are really working hard to elevate the voice of the parents as the experts on their children. Meetings are open, like Katie said, to parents, caregivers, the parent ally mentor, and the caregiver mentor. We find keeping the meeting small really allows everyone to feel they have an opportunity to participate in the meeting, as well as keeping the meeting positive and supportive for all participants. When we ask caregivers and parents what would help them feel more comfortable attending a meeting, like Katie said before, we resoundingly heard that the support of someone who understood what they were going through was critical. So we ensured that participants received that critical peer mentor support from individuals who had walked in their shoes. We contract with parent allies and experienced caregiver mentors to work with participants throughout the entire process. Mentors are encouraged to sit down and really talk with participants, explore their fears, talk about their concerns, and help participants understand why kids do better when all important adults in their life work together as a team. Connections meetings can be a useful tool to support a family any time a placement arrangement is changed throughout the life of a case, even when children are moving back home. A connections meeting follows a basic structured agenda facilitated by the parent ally mentor and the caregiver mentor. The intent is to guide the family in a conversation where essential information can be shared and the caregivers can learn directly from the parents what is important for them to know about caring for their little ones. One of the key components to a connections meeting is discussing a plan for ongoing communication between the parents and caregivers. 
The Connections Meeting is a safe place to discuss many different topics, and in most cases, a place where open minds can learn more about each other and change the initial perception many people have of the others involved. We aim to have a mentor pool that reflects the experiences of our participants by recruiting mentors with similar experiences, including BIPOC, relative caregivers, experience with SUD, and family treatment court. We do our best to match participants to mentors with similar life experiences, as there is great value in being supported by someone who truly gets where you are coming from. After a connections meeting has occurred, both the parents and care caregivers can continue to access the mentors for ongoing support, just another way that this program helps to build and demonstrate the importance of positive relationships. Slide is titled, Benefits of Connections. Immediate, parents know who is caring for their child creating a pathway for communication between parents and caregivers. Child sees the parents and caregivers working together. Caregivers can learn more about the child. Long term, increased parental and caregiver engagement. Increased communication leads to less conflict. Children maintain connections to their family regardless of permanency outcome. Caregiver retention increases as caregivers feel part of the team. Uh, thank you. When there is a positive relationship between caregivers and, men and parents, there are clear and, and immediate and long-term benefits. These relationships often last long after the child welfare case is closed. From my own experience and from what I have seen in the families I have worked with, the fear of not knowing who or how your child is being cared for is intense. At a time when everything in my world seemed to be spinning out of control and I was being asked to do so many things and change everything about my life, I was also preoccupied with the stress of worrying about whether or not my baby had her favorite stuffed animal or was being forced to eat food she didn't like or if she missed me singing her to sleep at night. Being able to meet the family was, who was, that was caring for my daughter gave me a way to visualize who she was with and how they treated her. It made me feel a lot better by taking the mystery away and giving me the opportunity to ask them questions and allowing them to do the same. We started out by passing a notebook back and forth at visits until we met. This did not happen consistently. Once we had a conversation about it, though, there was always something written in the book. Sometimes parents and caregivers just, to need, just need to communicate about what is comfortable for them regarding methods of communication. Maybe it's through email or text, a notebook, or even phone calls. Parents and caregivers who work together and coordinate communication and spend time together can lead by example how to nurture a positive relationship. Children who see the adults in their life practice healthy communication and boundaries are more likely to replicate those behaviors. Being able to have an open line of communication allows the caregivers to learn more about the children in their care too. Depending on the age of the children, some may be little, some may be too little to speak for themselves and some may be old enough but won't speak for themselves, and some just don't know the right words to say and struggle with communication skills. Caregivers can learn so much from the parents about what to expect from the child or why a child may act a certain way. There are small but very important details that many times the social worker doesn't know and therefore cannot share with the caregivers, and this creates barriers to the children receiving the best care possible. Increased parental and caregiver engagement has long-term benefits too. Children may become impatient or anxious or even act out the longer they are in care with no end in sight. But believing that everyone around them is working toward the same goal of reunification can relieve some of the stress which can be brought on by, given, by being given mixed messages. Developing a familial relationship happens naturally for some people and for others. It, it takes a lot of nurturing and patience and trust. This can't happen in one visit or one conversation. The beauty of this happens as the family grows together, heals together, and stays connected. Even after cases are closed, caregivers can continue to be a part of the children's lives as ongoing supports and cheerleaders of reunification. The success of ongoing communication and connection between birth parents and caregivers can even bring a new energy to caregivers to continue to open their home and their hearts to more children. Sharonda? Thank you for all of that, Sean. And I'll just say that, you know, from my vantage point, the benefits or connection is I actually want to just throw out a question. And the question is, who are we without connection? I know when I, you know, ponder that question, I think of isolation, I think of depression, I think of worry and anxiety. Connection is absolutely essential for me to be able to be a part of the world around me. And so the benefits for connection really for me are for everyone. It's not just for children, it is for parents, it is for foster parents, 
It is for the um, workforce that is witnessing and, and somewhat managing everything that's going on in a case. The more that we're able to connect with each other, the more that we're able to see the human side to be able to understand that our needs and wants are pretty much universal. The most important thing that I think about this connection and what this program actually offers is, is maintaining those relationships and building those relationships. That, you know, as life happens and we weather, you know, times and challenges and all the things that life offers, when we have connections, we're actually able to, to, to walk through those and to get to the other side and not fall into a place of despair and hopelessness. And so the benefits of connection are far reaching. They are absolutely essential and necessary not just for children, but for everyone who actually touches a child welfare case. I want to just end by just saying on this particular subject that um, children deserve to have as many people in their life that they love. And when we actually establish those connections, what we do is we build a big support network around children and families and communities, which strengthens each and every one of us as we walk through this incredible, <laughs> treacherous thing called life. Sure, um, Anna, could I jump in here with a story? Sure, sure. So I'm, I'm thinking as I listen to you and Sean about a connections meeting we had with a parent who was reunifying with his child, but he had never parented this child. The child had been out of home for the first two years of the child's life. And one of the most simple but touching pieces of this connections meeting was when the caregivers were working to set dad and the child up for success and reunification. And they said, you know what, if this little one is having a hard time or is, you know, struggling through this transition, give her some blueberries. She loves blueberries. And if you have blueberries on hand, it's kind of just something she really loves. And it was just such a simple thing, like having blueberries, but it just, I, I was so touched at like how that's going to support dad in this transition and that the child going home is not going to be this traumatic event where the child is ripped from the caregivers and given back to dad and dad has no idea what favorite foods are, what the bedtime routine. This was a beautifully planned transition and at the heart of it was making sure the transition was easy for this child and her parent and just really setting everyone up for success instead of, you know, this adversarial relationship where everybody is just struggling at the end. I mean, it was still hard. It is still absolutely hard when a child moves out of your home. But I can tell you when you have a relationship with the parents and you, you know the parents and you are able to be there and kind of move into the auntie role, it's awesome to be the auntie. And so that just... That's just a little story I wanted to share, and I'll toss it back to you, Sharonda. Thank you for sharing that story, uh, Katie. I appreciate that. So um, we have now heard about why connection is important for families and how the Family Connection Program can help build and support these relationships. But what can you do if you don't have the Family Connection pro Program available to you in your jurisdiction? Well, I'm going to introduce you to some great tools that you can be used to help your community start building caregiver and parent connections today. The first tool is a Family Connections videos and discussion guide. Um, and it will showcase real life experiences of parents and caregivers and relationships. And the video discussion guide, guides designed to jumpstart these connections. Discussion guides will help you identify barriers and solutions in your community. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Chris. One of the things I will now begin the that video. I really like about the relationship that me and Desiree have is that we are kind of co-parents with her. You know, if there's something going on, we all talk about it. And what should we do about it and things like that. But it isn't easy and it's, it's a lot of hard work, but it's worth it. The dynamic of me, Miss Yvette, and Yuvia is kind of like we're both her mom. She helps me and I help her. It's, it's a really amazing relationship. And if she didn't pick up the phone on that one phone call when I was in treatment, when I was talking to my daughter, maybe we wouldn't be sitting here today. But she wanted to reach out and encourage me and let me know that, you know, she loved having my daughter and she wants to see us back together. And it was just those little words of encouragement, like, okay, she's not trying to steal my kid. 
She wants us to reunite. Um, it made all the difference. Thank you. Uh, that video is amazing and once again just demonstrates, you know, the, the power of relationships and the long-term impact that there's not, you know, reunification, but what actually happens for families and UV with two parents. Who doesn't want that in their life? Um, so the next slide is we're going to actually talk about the some, some tools for you and resources. So the birth and foster parent partnership was formed by three organizations, which is the Children's Trust Fund Alliance, the Youth Law Center, and the Quality Parenting Initiative and Casing Family Programs to build a movement of collective voices to make improvements in policies and practice and change the system and culture around the foster care system and help families become reunified and ultimately prevent children from entering the system at all. This movement actually grew because of the BFFP, BFPP's hard work and commitment to strengthening families and keeping children together with their families. The BFPP met many times to help identify core practices and policies that would support strong relationships between birth and foster parents. The BFPP reviewed the research and gathered input from birth and resource parents and staff about the, what, what works and what doesn't work. All of this led to this idea of developing two new tools to help promote the importance of birth and foster parent relationships all across the country. The hope is, is really to bring shifting attitudes and practices of child welfare leaders and practitioners, other system leaders, foster parents, birth parents, and kinship caregivers. The BFPP has consistently focused on promoting lasting relationships between birth and foster families and kinship caregivers to support families to help children, to help child welfare systems improve their practices around supporting birth and foster parent relationships. We worked hard to create two complementary tools to assist in promoting the shift in attitudes and practice. The relationship guide is the most useful for birth and foster parents and kinship caregivers working to build and sustain relationships and work towards reunification. The state and local leaders guide to building a strong policy and practice foundation is most useful for staff and administrators working to create, create systems that will best support these relationships. And we also create an executive summary that provides a brief overview of the BFPP. Amy, yep, let me turn it over. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Amy. Awesome, thank you. So the first of the two guides is the birth and foster parent. Um, so the first guide is the relationship building guide, excuse me. It's filled with uh, lots of great information organized with four distinct relationship building topics. <clears throat> the first one is building the relationship. The second is supporting the relationship. Third is keeping the relationship strong while working with the system and planning for reunification. Um, and the fourth is keeping the relationship strong after the family leaves the system. This guide's intended use is, the guide's intention is to be used by families whose children are in foster care or placed with kinship caregivers, and that includes both um, mothers and fathers, so both parents. Um, it's also intended for foster families or kinship caregivers caring for children or youth placed out of the home. And then it's also intended for public or private agency staff who are working with um, parents and caregivers um, in building a relationship. So the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, the second tool is the state and local leaders guide to building a strong policy and practice foundation. Um, this tool is useful for child welfare stakeholders who are working to create systems that will best support these relationships. This guide covers the following. Um, it, it covers how beneficial it is when parents and caregivers are able to work together. Um, the key elements of cultural change, what the experts say. So it, it 
includes recommendations from birth and foster parents engaged in the partnership. So you'll hear some stories and uh, recommendations from the experts, which are the parents and foster parents. And then you're going to also um, see promising practices and policies and then implementation, implementation tips, so strategies that facilitate strong parent and foster parent partnership. Um, so next we are going to hand it off to Katie and she's going to lead us in a poll. Thank you, Amy. I'm going to go ahead and start my webcam here. So I wanted to take just a second and speak to you guys all about language. So you might have noticed the language in the tools said birth and foster parent, but some of us, we want to really just talk about the language. And when these tools were developed, the terms that we use to describe parents and caregivers or foster parents and birth parents, the individuals doing this work, which were parents and foster parents, those are the terms they wanted to be used, wanted to be used. But we recognize that this is undergoing a evolution and that there are lots of different terms that are being used all across this country. And so what you have heard and what might be used in your state, we recognize that it might be different in other states. And But we want to also just think about the power of our words and how our words impact, impact people. And so I remember when I first, the kids needed a replacement parent. And just that term set up an adversarial relationship where I came to the relationship with preconceived notions and judgments. And so I don't think we've settled on what, what everyone wants to be called, but just being intentional about language and thinking about language is just important. And so. Hi, everybody. This is Jennifer Marcelli. I'm the Program Area Manager for Foster Care for the Capacity Building Center for State. Um, so the poll question is, um, after hearing from all of our fantastic presenters today and all of their information and resources, what is one thing that you're going to take from this presentation that will inform your daily practice? Um, I, I see some things uh, to reinforce the human side of connection so our children and families can successfully walk through their experiences with child welfare, um, implementing the connections meetings, um, I have a few of those. Um, Encouraging the importance of collaboration between resource and birth parents. We've heard how critical that is. Um, the value of interpersonal connections. Um, offering more resources for developing relationships and connections between birth and foster families. More about the connections meetings and those relationships. Um, ways to implement birth family relationships healthy birth family relationships and foster family relationships, the reunification resources, of being my, more mindful when working with both foster parents and bio parents. These are all really great. We're glad that you have so many great things. I see in the chat to continue to introduce and encourage parent caregiver interactions, start exploring more explicit avenues for connection. Um, somebody who really loves the idea of connecting parents with caregivers of the children. So lots, lots around parent and the caregiver connections, creating some informal and formal ways to make that happen. Thank you, everybody, for giving us your feedback on the poll. Katie, I'm not sure if you're back. I am working on getting back, um, but I still can't see the screen, so just a second. Okay. No worries. We can also, um, I'm not sure if you or anyone else has any last words before we move to the Q&A, but we can move to that um, if you would like. I see her coming back on. All right, I'm back. Well, sorry for that technical glitch, everyone. Um, excellent. Um, so I just wanted to thank you all for coming today, for listening to us, to hearing, hearing our stories, hearing our visions. And I just absolutely love the answers in the poll. Like that just energizes me and brings me so much joy that all of you are taking these back to your communities and that we're starting these conversations. And recognizing change doesn't happen overnight, but seeing seeing the wave of change is 
incredibly exciting and invigorating for me. So I, I want to encourage you, if you have any questions about the Family Connections program or any of the resources, you can feel free to reach out to me, and I would be, I'd love to talk about this stuff. So I'd be happy to talk about it more. Um, now I think we are going to turn it over to Jennifer for a question and answer. And so I would love it if you guys have questions about the program or anything we're doing, please pop them in the chat. And I have all these great presenters ready to answer them for you. Yes. So we'll Thanks. ask everybody to hop off on camera. Um, so we did receive a few throughout the presentation. Um, and the first one, Deanna, um, is for you. Um, the question was, does Washington DCFS still have family group decision-making programming at, at all? Uh, yes, <clears throat> it's uh, family team decision-making in our neck of the woods, but yes, we still have that in all our shared planning meetings. Great, thank you. Um, and so for all of our presenters, our Family Connections presenters, um, a few other questions. Um, who is included in the peer mentors, caregivers, and who else? So the, the peer mentors are caregivers and relative caregivers and anyone who's caring for a child placed out at home. Um, and if they've had if they've been able to successfully build relationships, then we would love to have them help others and just guide others on their journey. And then the peer or the parents, um, we have a program in Washington State called Parents for Parents. Phenomenal program and our parent allies come through that program. So they've already entered P4P as parent allies. And then if they have a passion for building these connections, then they can also work with us to, to facilitate these meetings. And so I'm always, always on the lookout for individuals who have those unicorn stories and trying to get them in here to do the work. Um, so that's kind of how my recruitment works. Great. That was the next question about recruitment, so you answered that. Um, and then, are there any efforts to prioritize kinship care? Absolutely. So, um, so my program kind of comes in after a placement decision has been made. So we have don't have any impact on placement decisions, but we absolutely can support um, caregiver or kinship caregiver and parent relationships. And I am going to kind of dovetail into another question I see here about what if what if the caregiver is a relative and they already have a poor or broken relationship? I have some terrific mentors who have that. They had a broken relationship, they are relatives, and they have since repaired it. And so that's where we really try our very best to match participants. And so if I had that case, I would match that to my caregiver who's a relative caregiver, and then a parent ally who's had experience in, in a relative placement. And so that's not something I can speak to. I've only done licensed foster care, but I try I try to match because you don't want to hear from me. I, I haven't been a relative caring, but Sharonda, for example, has walked the walk and can share a wealth of information with someone else going down this path. And so we really work to try and match as much as we can. Can I just piggyback a little bit off of that? I just, I, I want to just highlight um, the, the benefit well outside of just what happened for King with me and Amy uh, being paired together. As a kinship caregiver, taking on a child is an incredible endeavor and, and there's an amazing amount of stress culminated with the grief and the anger of a parent. And I can tell you that if it wasn't for the relationship that I had with Amy, I don't know if I would have been able to weather as much as the anger that was coming at me from my child. So. What I really think is important for us to kind of highlight in this op in, in this space is is be creative, be innovative, and use resources and tools that maybe didn't necessarily look like they were prepared for such in, in such a way. And you know, for example, right, the foster parent that I had that helped to kind of circumvent some of my pain, anguish, and anxiety wasn't necessarily a foster parent designed to support a kinship caregiver but I needed the support. 
And so I think it's so important for us not to get boxed in to what exactly someone can or cannot do. We can do a lot together. The power of people, the power of relationships, and the power of connection ripples far outside of just the confines of birth parent, foster parent, child. So, you know, I really just want to, you know, encourage folks to think about, you know, how to utilize the resources in ways that maybe you never, ever thought you could. My relationship with Amy is because I knew I needed something, and my immediate support system did not have it. So I had to go and find it if I was going to be successful in actually caring for my grandson and actually dealing with my son. Thanks to you both. Um, another question in, in here, and I, I know we hear this a lot from folks, um, Sarah says, one concern I've noticed many caregivers refuse to work directly with parents even after parent strengths are mentioned, even after safety concerns are discussed. Caregivers state they don't want to ever meet parent, even meet parents. Who do we encourage contact to begin a connection? So maybe you can talk a little bit about how that's been for you all. John, do you want to take that one? Um, well, I think in, in this situation, um, you know, even with the previous connections meetings that we've done, there have also been relationships that were strained um, from the get-go, from preconceived notions and ideas about the other people in the case. Um, and so one of the things that I think helps with this is when caregivers can be connected to a caregiver, mentor, or peer, and the parents can also be connected to a peer. And you know what? This happens before a connections meeting even happens. We work with them individually. We talk about um, what you know topics they want to bring up, what's important to them, what challenges or barriers they may have had prior to this meeting happening in their relationship, what they would like to see for future communication and how to build a stronger relationship. Um, and then the caregiver and the, the peer mentor actually have a conversation and communicate um, what that discussion is going to look like when we actually facilitate the meeting. So that way it can be structured but I think that initial connection between um, a, a caregiver who is resistant uh, to communicating with the family or opening themselves up to a relationship with the parent, connecting them to another caregiver who's had a successful relationship and actually can see that positive outcome is, is the best way to go. I, I agree completely with Sean. And then there's also great benefit to being connected to that caregiver with a parent, the parent ally, who can share their experience, kind of address their fears. And I think, I mean, there's not a one-size-fits-all reason why this is happening, but when we aren't intentional about building these relationships, when we don't put supports in place for these relationships to happen, and we just say, go meet each other and hope it goes well, then what can happen is you're hearing there's a lot of stuff being brought to this first meeting and if we are not giving support to this then maybe that first meeting goes poorly because the caregiver doesn't realize that the parents children were removed three days ago and the parent is absolutely grieving and is possibly going to lash out at the caregiver as being seen as someone part of the system but you talk to the caregiver ahead of time with a connections meeting and you let them know, hey, this is what the parent might be experiencing. The parent may not be in a place to be able to just say, thank you so much for taking my children. And so it's really setting those expectations, being intentional about how we build these relationships that set them up for success. An important thing is this, this program is entirely voluntary. It's not court ordered. It's not a service. It's a voluntary thing. And so if someone truly doesn't want to be a part of it, they are never going to be forced to be a part of it. But often it's fear. We just drill down to at the base of everybody is fear in these relationships, fear of building them, fear of what could happen, fear of boundaries, how is this all going to work? And so when we are intentional and structured about building relationships, most people buy in. Thank you both. Um, sort of a connected, a connected question. Tara asks, have you ever seen situations where it's not safe for parents and foster parents to build connections? And if so, what have you done in those situations, especially to help support the child? Absolutely. So we do. We, we rely um, on the social worker. They are involved at the beginning. 
and they let us know, is there a safety concern that precludes a meeting? And if there is a way to work around it, like a no contact order between parents, we could do two separate meetings. But if there is a true safety concern or a parent is unavailable, say the parent is incarcerated, we can do what's called a paper connections meeting. And so same process, each one gets a mentor, and then the mentor helps them fill out some documents that we've created. So the parent has a chance to write down a little bit about themselves. And it's not, it's not, it's like, where do you live? And what's important about your family for the other person to know? And so they are absolutely given that opportunity. And then we take it on to make sure that those papers do get exchanged. And so if there's a true safety concern, we can do a paper, paper exchange of information, make sure the information gets to the other person. We can absolutely talk about, like, if I have a caregiver who does not feel comfortable sharing where they live, then we can talk about, like, in that question, where do you live? I live in a neighborhood full of kids with parks nearby and a nice wooded trail we walk on. None of you have any idea where I live, but if you're a parent, you have a little bit better idea of where your kid's living. And so we, we can really um, customize it like that. That's great. That's great to hear. Um, as you all were beginning this program and as you, um, you know, have been doing it through the years, what, what are some lessons learned? What are some challenges you had and how did you overcome those? So um, I feel very, very, very strongly that the mentors need to be compensated for their time and their sharing of lived experiences. And so from the very beginning of conception, this has been a program where I want to pay my mentors. And that has been a big barrier and a big challenge because as we all know in child welfare, trying to find funds is challenging. And so we actually had funding in the legislature last last year and then between the time the funding was granted to us and the governor signed the budget, COVID came and there were a bunch of COVID related vetoes and our program was, was unfortunately our funding was one of them. And so we have spent the last year working really hard um, through the organization and through Amara trying to find any grant we can because we firmly believe that this needs to be available to families. But I also am very, strongly, um, it's very important to me that we pay people and not, we're not doing it as volunteers. So that's kind of the biggest barrier is finding, finding funding, finding funding and um, customizing it to locales. So it's not, I mean, there's a structure of the program certainly, but each county, each jurisdiction works differently. And so I work really hard to go in and kind of figure out how can our program dovetail what they're doing instead of coming in and being like, here, we have a solution, now do exactly what we say, because that's not going to work well at all. So it's really those nuances and building those relationships within the community to figure out how to intentionally move into a community as a support and not, not kind of just fitting a square peg in a round hole and forcing our way in. Anything else from the rest of the team? All right. Well, those were the end of the questions that we had, and we, we only have a few minutes left. So um, I want to, again, thank all of our fantastic presenters today for sharing your passion and your stories um, and your information and resources about how we can better support families to reunify as we celebrate National Reunification Month. So um, again, thank you all for your time um, in presenting. And thank you to our audience for coming on today and, and sharing your own resources in the, in the pod and um, connecting to each other. That was great to see. Contact us. Website, https colon slash slash capacity.childwelfare.gov slash states. Email, capacity info at icf.com. Phone 844-222-0270.